Okay, so I'm working number 10 on the web work of 3.7. Everything's gonna be kind of. Let's see if I can zoom it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I can't really see it either. It's like polarity and what? Ionic equation or stuff like that. And like the redox equations, reactions like that. see when I take my glasses out. flies at a constant altitude of two miles and a constant speed of 600 miles per hour on a straight course that it will take it directly over a kangaroo on the ground. Well, of course. How fast is the angle of elevation of the kangaroo's line of sight increasing when the distance from the kangaroo to the plane is three miles? The answer should be in radians per minute. Okay. All right, so let me diagram this and then I'll get the web work out of the way. Okay, so constant altitude of two miles. Let's see how I can do this. All right, not with that marker. Okay, the airplane is coming over this way. 600 miles per hour. On a straight course, it'll take it directly over a kangaroo on the ground. Let's put our kangaroo right here. How fast is the angle of elevation increasing? All right, so let's just draw the angle of elevation to the original spot. That's this one. How fast is that increasing? So we want E theta. Dt. We need it at some particular instant. So it's when the distance from the kangaroo to the plane is three miles. Have all my numbers in here? Okay, I'm going to shut that screen out momentarily. Shut that off, projector off, projector off. 
And then let me zoom in under the board. There we go. Okay, so that's what we got there. The other thing that's changing is, well, a couple of things are changing. This distance, which corresponds to that distance, and then this distance is changing. So we got three things changing here. Let me put an X here and a Z there. I don't know if I need Z because it didn't give us any information about that. This 600 corresponds to DX DT. So I don't think I need the Z. So let me rub that out so that you don't get confused and want to try to use it. I think I can make it work from here. And I know that because all I need to do is get some sort of equation that relates um, X and Z at any time T. And I already see one. I got an angle and I have the side adjacent to that angle. I have the side opposite that angle. So I can pull out a trig function. You know which one I want to use? Tangent will work. So we need the equation that relates them to any time T and this will be it. Tangent of angle theta is the opposite, which is fixed at two, divided by the adjacent, which is X. So once we have the equation, we can take the derivative with respect to T. What's the derivative of tangent? So over here, I'm going to get secant squared of theta times d theta dt. Think of 2 over x as 2 times x to the negative 1. And so when we take its derivative, we get minus 2 times x to the negative 2 times dx dt. We are solving for d theta dt. We have a fixed value of x. That's going to be the three miles. Nope, that's not three miles. That was the z, wasn't it? We don't have a fixed value of x. We need this. And then we're going to need this. So let's redraw this picture. When this distance is three, then we can figure out x, and we can also figure out the secant of this angle. So before we can substitute, let's redraw this. I've got three here. This is still two. And now let's do the Pythagorean theorem to find that link. We have a squared plus two squared is three squared. So I've got a squared will be nine minus four. So A is going to be the square root of 5. And that's really not A, that's X, isn't it? Why did I use an A? Got the X to fill in there. Now I want you to look at the picture and tell me what the secant of that angle is at that instant. Good. Hypotenuse over adjacent. The secant of that angle. The hypotenuse over the adjacent. And now let's fill everything in. Let's put that x squared on the bottom. Keep the negative 2 on top. So this becomes 3 over the square root of 5. Then I got to square it. We're solving for this seller. This I said I was going to write as negative 2 over x squared. So we just found x to be the square root of 5. And dx dt was given as 600. Let's see, this becomes 9 fifths. That's a negative two fifths times the 600. Uh, so negative 1200 over five. And so we're going to divide by this number. 
which is equivalent to multiplying by the reciprocal. And then the fives will cancel. And so we get that d theta dt. is a negative 1200 over nine radians per hour. And I'm never sure if it wants the minus sign in the answer. So try it both ways until it takes one of them. It, it, it's pretty crazy. Though. Yeah. Like, Does it? It's, I mean, sometimes like it takes a fractional form as long as you know it's the next one decimal. I don't know why I, it shouldn't be negative, right? Because as that plane gets closer, the angle is getting bigger. So let's blow the sign off. I probably should have made um, X a negative number since it's getting smaller. So let's just answer it in sentence. The angle increases in size at a rate of 1200 over nine radians per hour. Okay. Sorry, I thought I'm talking. Is it in radians per minute? Yes. Wow, so I got to change it to minutes? Well, that stinks. All right, well, let's change it to radians per minute. Let's see, 1200 radians per hour, 1200 over nine. I need to get my hours to cancel. So one hour is 60 minutes. 60 goes into 1200 20 times. So that will be 20 over nine radians per minute. Yeah, that's kind of sneaky. Make me read the question or something. Does it want the units? Does it need the units? I thought so. All right, what's next? Want to know what it is about this set that, that gave you trouble? Other than that sneaky thing of making me convert my units. Anybody have one they want me to work? When I look at them, I feel like 10. That's the one, that's 10 that I just did. Nine. Kite. Want that one? That might be very similar to what we just did. Cone. The boat coming in. Shall we work this one? The other one with the angle is the kite. And do the one with the kite. Uh oh, just lost it. Go back. You do that to me. Nope, I want to go down. Not the most. All right, we're going to work this one with the kite here. Let me read it. A kite is 50 feet above the ground and it moves horizontally at a speed of four feet per second. At what rate? is the angle between the string and the horizontal decreasing when 200 feet of string has been let out. So the picture is just about the same. Change the plane to a kite. 
and put the point on the ground. Let's rub all this junk out. We'll do it over here on this board on the west. Let me draw the picture and then I'll put the screen back up. Number nine. All right, so the tight is here. Moving horizontally, point on the ground. Here's the string that's attached to the tight. The kite stays 50 feet above the ground, so he stays at 50. It's going this way at four feet per second. At what rate is the angle? So again, we need an angle here. It's going to be increasing when 200 feet of string. So this is going to change, and this is going to change. So when Z is 200. So we want the answer in radians per second, which is good because everything is already in, in the right units. I think I got all my numbers here. All right, let me see what we're going to say. So I really am looking for d theta dt at that instant. This number is going to be the dx dt. So I really don't need to involve this in the equation. This number is going to come into play like it did over here when I need to find the measurements of x and theta at an instant. So if I just ignore that and use my tangent again and write that same equation we did a second ago, then when I need that value, I can put it in. So the equation was that the tangent of this angle is the opposite over the adjacent. Same derivative, secant squared of theta d theta dt, and this will simplify to negative 50 over x squared dx dt. So we're going to need this again and this again at that instant. <coughs> Let's draw that. This is 50. This is 200, and this is our x and our theta. So let's get x real quick. 50 squared plus x squared is 200 squared. So this is 25 with a couple of zeros. E squared is four with four zeros. So subtract 2,500 and I get X squared is 80 that number. And so X is the square root of that number. Let's go west board. Okay, funky numbers, but we're okay. Now, when that number is here, I can get the secant of theta. Because the secant is still the adjacent, oops, say it the other way, hypotenuse over adjacent.
So we're going to fill that in here. I'll do that right up here. All right, so secant is that number, and I've got to square it. You say the VT is what we're solving for. I'm going to have negative 50 over my X all squared. <clears throat> The XTT, I just rubbed it out. What was it? My problem? It was four. It was four? So we'll just divide by that and then we're done. I will not use crunch numbers today anymore. All of this. Four times five is, well, again, it's increasing, so let's blow the sign off. Square that, and I just get this. And I'm going to have a 200 squared down here, and this number up here. So that number squared. And cancel anyway. One of those cancels. So D theta DT, one over 200 radians per second. Uh, so that there was an instant replay of that last problem. Yes. I know I want to make, but on number 10. I think so. Um, I have those exact same numbers and I came to the exact same final answer, which is negative 12. We'll take the sign off of it well, and convert it. You got to convert it to radians per second. <clears throat> so you have to take your answer and divide by 60. This is radians per hour and the problem asks for radians per second. Uh, so divide it by 60. I did the same thing. To take off the sign because it's it's increasing so i should have made the x negative or the dxdt negative but it's increasing any others yes sir i can't sorry the air conditioner is way too loud 11. On problem number 11, consider a piece of ice in the shape of a sphere that's melting at five cubic inches per minute. Model the volume of ice by a function of radius r. How fast is the radius changing at the instant when the radius is four in inches? And then how fast is the surface area changing at that same time? So let me write that down and then I can rub this off here to the old east board. So we need to use both the volume and the surface area formulas for the sphere. Problem 11. So for sphere, the volume is four thirds pi r u, and the surface area is four pi r squared. So I want you to notice that if you take the derivative of a volume formula, we'll get the area formula. 
of the folks who are. That's always true. Now let me take my numbers. The ice is melting at a rate of five cubic inches per minute. What kind of entity is measured in cubic inches? Volume, and that's a per minute, so that's a dv dt. It's melting, so it's getting smaller. So we should probably make it negative. How fast is the radius changing at the instant when the radius is four inches? Find the R dt when R is equal to four. DRDT when R is four. Since we're given this, I'm going to find DRDT by taking the derivative of this equation. So I should like to just write this essentially, but with my right lettering, I will have a DV DT will be the three will cancel that one. 4 pi r squared dr dt. And so we have r is 4. We're looking for dr dt and we have dv dt. So to fill them in now, we get minus 3 is 4 pi r is 4. So I get a 4 squared here. And dr dt is what we solve for. So actually I have four cubed, so negative three over four cubed times pi. So the radius is decreasing at a rate of minus three, what is that, 64 pi uh, inches per minute. And then we want to know how fast is the surface area changing at that time. So next we want to find DADT at that instant. And now we go here and take the derivative. So DADT is going to be 8 pi r DRDT. Now let's fill in our DRDT that we just got. And we got R, and so that'll give us this. R was, where'd it go? Four. DRDT is negative three over 64 pi. So four times eight is 32, and the pi goes into that twice. So I'm left with a negative three halves um, square inches per minute. So the area is decreasing by that rate. What do you think? So we work them all. Okay. I want to cover one more section today that will be on your test one week from today. That's number two is Wednesday, October 20th, covering all of chapter three and sections will go on. 4.1.
I think you like chapter four. You guys are pretty easy to please. You like everything so far. We've learned to take all these derivatives. Now we're going to use them. We're going to use them to find the largest and smallest values of a function. And in section 4.1, the title of it is in the book. Is something called the extreme values. Of a continuous function. Oh, swap to the old West board. Extreme values of a continuous function. The picture tells us everything we need to know. I'm going to draw you a continuous function and you're going to point to the extreme values. Let's see. So here's an example of a continuous function with a few wiggles in it. Can you show me where the largest value of this function is? Yeah, they're both the ends are going up and up forever and ever. So there's the largest value is just infinite. What about the smallest value? Right there, huh? All right. So if a, a function has both ends going on and on forever, then there is no largest and smallest value. Now, if you have a continuous function defined on a closed interval where I can erase these arrows at the end. Say I put it from here to here. Say that that's at point B and maybe to here. At point A. Then you are guaranteed or your money back that this continuous function is going to have both a largest value and a smallest value, at least one of each. So the statement of this is that given a continuous function on a closed interval, then that continuous function attains both its very largest value, which we're going to call its absolute maximum, and its very smallest value, absolute minimum. In our picture, this point here, let's just put, uh, put some important points on here. So those correspond to these. So let's say that's C1, C2, C3, C4, C5. So just make that a big old zero. Let F be a continuous function defined on a closed interval. Then F attains both an absolute maximum <coughs> value and an absolute minimum value. Look 
this, you just say, duh, well, of course. But when I look at this, it brings back memories. Once upon a time, many, many years ago, I had to take an oral exam in order to get my master's degree. I chose the non-thesis option because I'm a doofus. <laughs> I had to stand up for three hours and talk math. This was my first question. Theorem has a name and they wanted to know what the proof of it was and everything. So of course I chose. I didn't even know my name at that instant. I'm wetting myself. Tears are coming out of every eyeball. I made it. I made it. Kind of. I keep my degree hidden just in case there's a knock at my door and one in the back. Fraud! But anyway, the picture makes it obvious. Here, um, the picture also tells us where we have to check for this thing. We won't have the graph looking at us, we'll just have a function looking at us. So if we say, well, if I look at the values of the function at these relative extreme values and compare those y values with the y values at the endpoints, then I'm bound to find the absolute max and min. So. You look for the absolute max and min. Yep. Of each, or each one or just. No, the absolute max and min of the entire picture, which is the largest y value, which is the smallest y value. So I've got a cluster of large y values and a cluster of small y values, and I just compare them in size. So the values of x at which the tangent line is horizontal. Tangent line is horizontal are called critical values, critical points. The point is really an ordered pair. So I could call them a critical value, meaning that's just one X. But critical, that's pretty important, right? Critical. Um, they describe where the function has relative extreme values. You have to go to that board. This one would give me a relative max. This one would give me a relative max. This is a relative min. This is a relative min. And that was a relative min. Relative to the points around it. A uh, value of the function is called a relative maximum if it's larger than the values of f in a small interval around that point. So f at whichever c I'm stating is a relative max if f of c is bigger than f of x for all x in an interval around that point c. And similarly, f of c is a relative min if it's a smaller y value than any other y value in an interval around c. So the way we go hunting for absolute extreme values is we find all the values of x at which the derivative is zero. Then we take the two x's that are the endpoints, the a and the b, and we plug them into this equation. The very largest one is the absolute max. 
and the very smallest one is the absolute min. And sometimes I call that the candidates test. We assemble a list of the candidates and then we evaluate them to decide which one's the biggest and the smallest. That up here. Find absolute extrema. Okay, so an absolute max together with an absolute min forms the absolute extrema, the set of extreme values of a continuous function. On that closed interval A, B, first find all critical numbers in that interval, and then compare the Y values. At each critical number and at these two endpoints. The largest is the absolute max, the smallest is the absolute min. We just plug and chug. What you say that absolute extrema is? The set of points, absolute max, absolute min, okay. extreme values. So that's a lot of writing to do something pretty quickly. Given a function, you have to identify that it's continuous on that closed interval. Then you'll take its derivative and find where the derivative is zero. <laughs> And then you'll plug those numbers into the original function to check out what the y values look like at those critical numbers and at the two endpoints. And then you say, look, this is the biggest number and this is the smallest number. So, so, you did my examples. Isn't everything? Not the hard examples. Here's my easy examples. Careful where to look. Oops, that didn't work. Come back. Move it over. Move it over. Move it the, over uh, the screen. Yes. Yeah, I want to move a little chat smaller too. How do I do that? Follow the arrow. Okay, I got to go to the. No better. Let's take f x to be four x cubed minus five x squared. Minus 8x plus 10. Let f be defined 
on the closed interval. Oh, let's go from zero to three. Absolute max and min of that on that interval. So as you're writing this down, tell me what the graph of this thing looks like. Third degree polynomial. And Probably has more wiggles than that because of these curves. So it's probably going to look some version of this. Right? Yeah. So I'm anticipating two critical numbers. Don't know if they're both going to be in here, but we'll find out. The critical numbers are the values at which the derivative is zero. So I wonder if I take the derivative and see if you get a second degree polynomial that you can factor when you set it equal to zero, and then set each factor equal to zero and solve for x. So we're convinced that this is continuous, right? Because it's just a plain old polynomial. So you're guaranteed they're there. I want to see if you can find them. Find the two critical numbers, see if they're both in the interval. Yep, your factoring skills. So when you take the derivative, I suggest you pull out the greatest common factor to help you factor it more easily. 12, 10, and 8 are all divisible by 2. So pull a 2 out of it. They're going to play around with factors of 6 and factors of 4. So that when they're placed in such a way, you'll get a middle term of negative five. Or if you're lazy, you can use the quadratic formula. Lazy. Calling you out. Factoring is fun. It's a little puzzle. Quadratic formula is mindless. Drivel. Unless you need it. I'm going to go with three and Two, maybe. Well, if there's time, you gotta you gotta work on what you're bad at. Well, that's what a football team though. <laughs> I remember after the after the Texas game, we're getting on the bus with the team, and all these players like apologizing. That will never happen again. I promise. We're gonna fix it. <laughs> I call BS on that one. <laughs> ah, sports, just one disappointment after another. Actually, I'm going to go with four, because if it's two and two, that means it's a common factor. So I'm going to put a four somewhere. I don't know if I want a 12, so I'm going to put the four here and the one there and hope that that works. That's an eight. That's a three. An eight minus three is five, so let's make that negative. Is that positive? That's a two right here. I'm going to set our derivative equal to zero. I got it. Were you able to do it? 
Did I butt into Sam? Then you're going to set each factor equal to zero. The two doesn't matter, divide it out. 3x minus 4 is equal to zero. When 3x is 4, or x is 4 thirds, 2x plus 1 is zero. When 2x is 1, or x is negative 1 half. Let's take a look at where we live. We are living in the interval from 0 to 3. So let's toss the negative one half away. So now I know that if this thing has an absolute max and min, it's going to occur either when x is four thirds, when x is zero, when x is three. So let's go for the big reveal. Um, I'm going to take those x's. And I'm going to plug them in to our equation. So let me just write it down so I could do it over here mentally. Let's do the easy ones first. Let's do the zero and three first. The next is zero. All of those are zero. So my y value is 10. When x is 3, 3 cubed is 27, 4 times 27 is 108, 3 squared is 9, 5 times 9 is 45, 3 times 8 is 24 plus 10. Let's see if I get to use the marker here. It's got all wicky on me. Okay, so let's see. This gives me 69 from 118. Forty-nine. Now comes the fun one. Four just thirds. Do, you can just do one, right? Because you know there's only one vertical one. Yeah. I got to take it compared to the endpoints. Yeah, because it's it's continuous and there's only one vertical. It's only turning once. So you can solve for one and just see if it's over under. Well, I had to see what it's over under first, so I do have to do all the points. See what I mean? I mean, I have to check the y values of the endpoints and the critical number. Okay. All right. Let's see. Four cubed. Actually, I have four to the four which is 16 times 16 is 256 over 3 cubed is 27. 4 squared is 16 times 5 is 80 over 3 squared is 9. 4 times 8 is 32 over 3 plus 10. Let's get this old common denominator going. Let's see, I need to multiply this by 3 over 3. 3 times 9 is 27. 3 times 8 is 24. Now I'm going to multiply by 9. 3 times 9 is 27, I said. 9 times 32. Eight. And then that's 10 over 1. Now I'm multiplying by 27 over 27. So that's 270 over 27. Okay, here we go. 256 plus 270. Five twenty six minus two forty two eighty six minus two eighty eight is a negative two over twenty seven. Maybe it's the only negative number in the list, so that one's clearly the absolute minimum. Forty nine is the largest, so that's the absolute maximum.
So had there been another tax value, then you would just compare whichever one's highest and lowest. Yep. And just, so yep. Like, just make your list of critical numbers in the interval, the two endpoints of the interval, and then plug and chug to pick out the biggest and the smallest. Yeah. So the trick is going to be this part, right? This part. So we got to have some practice. Let's try. polynomial do the same for um, f of x we're going with x to the three x to the fifth minus 20 x to the third and let's let our interval be from negative one to two Do the same thing, take the derivative. Set the derivative equal to zero. It's very possible you're gonna get four critical points. Right, it's a fifth degree polynomial, so it's derivative is fourth degree. There might be four solutions to the equation, fourth degree polynomial is equal to zero. But not all four of them are guaranteed to be in the interval, keep only those that are. You're only going to get three critical numbers. Yeah, notice that you just have a polynomial, so you're guaranteed that it's continuous on that interval. So that means those max and mins will be there. And the derivative is plenty easy. Let's see, I get 15x to the fourth minus 60x squared. And the greatest common factor will be a 15x squared. Leave me an x squared minus four. How does x squared minus four factor? The left arm is zero when any factor is zero. First factor is zero when x is zero. Second one when x is negative two. Third one when x is positive two. Are they all keepers? No. Throw away x is negative two. It's not, not of any interest to us. And now we're going to look at our candidates. One of the critical numbers happens to be an endpoint, so that saves us some time. We just check the value of the function. 
at these three points, zero, two, and negative one. We're plotting points now back on the graph of F. So let's see, the first and the last one are relatively easy. Put zero in there and I get zero. A negative one to an odd power is still a negative one. So this is gonna be here, negative three plus 20 is 17. And here we've got three times 32 minus 20 times eight. So I have 96 minus 160 is a negative. Hmm, 96 minus 160. Four. Sixty-four. It's negative, so it's clearly the smallest. Seventeen is the biggest. So here's our absolute max. Here's our absolute min. Okay, so I can see that you're sick of polynomials. Out, out. Let's see. Next one. Find f of theta to be the square root of three times theta minus two times the cosine of theta. So it should be the absolute max and min. <laughs> On the interval from zero to two pi. So what do you know about trig functions, sines and cosine in particular? They're uh, continuous, right? Continuously wobble back and forth. This is just a polynomial term in theta. The difference between two continuous functions is always continuous. So we don't have any breaks in this graph. It behaves the way we want it to. Now let's see if you can find where the derivative is zero. Get two critical numbers in the interval. Let's see if you can get them. Let me go to the other board. There are two critical numbers inside that interval. What were your two critical numbers? Four pi over three and five pi over three. I like that.
root cosine is a negative sine, so this becomes plus two sine of theta. And when we set that equal to zero, we solve for sine of theta first by subtracting the square root of three and dividing by two. So the sine is negative in quadrants three and four. The sine is the square root of three over two at pi thirds. So we need the quadrant three version of pi thirds. Pi plus pi thirds is four pi thirds. And then if we go one pi third further, that puts us in quadrant four. Pi thirds plus four pi thirds is five pi thirds. Both of those are between zero and two pi. So both of those are candidates for the location of the absolute max and min. So we're gonna to have to do some approximating here. Let's figure out the value of f at those places. So Four pi thirds, five pi thirds, zero and two pi. Let's do the easy ones first. What's the cosine of zero and the cosine of two pi? Cosine of zero and two pi are both one. So this, when I put a zero in here, I just get minus two times one. And when I put a two pi in here, I have two pi times the square root of three minus two. If I know the cosine at pi over three, then you cosine at pi over three. Square root of three. One half, right? One half. In quadrant three, cosine is negative. So this is a negative one half times the two gives me plus one. And then I have four pi over three times the square root of three. Cosine is positive in quadrant four. So this is going to be a positive one back here. So we're going to have five pi square root of three over three minus two. So I gotta get these numbers on a calculator. I'm not even gonna pretend that I know these numbers. I did this once upon a time. Where are they at? Where are they at? Where are they at? At four pi over three, this is roughly equal to 8.3. 5 pi over 3, we get a number that's about 8.1. And at 2 pi, we get 8.9. So I could never have approximated that accurately. But there's only one negative number, so by gosh, that's the min. And 8.9 is the largest, so that's the max. The max and min occurred at the end point. Okay, so my plan is, is that we have our test in one week. Wednesday, October 20. How far did our first test go? Didn't it have some derivatives on it? Yes, yes. We went up to... I think we stopped for the break. Yeah, so we know. pick it up from 3 3? I think so. So 3 3 are the derivatives of the other functions. 3.4 was that movement along the number line type problem. 
3.5 was the chain rule. Maybe. Maybe. Yep, 3.6 was implicit differentiation. 3.7 was related rates. 3.8 was the linear approximation and the differential. And then 4.1 is the absolute maximum of a continuous function. So that was relatively short. Normally I have section 4.2 on here as well. Yes, it's not fair to tell me that, is it? I'll put the review sheet up today. Um, I already have the web work that contains this also contains 4.2. So you can just do this 4.1 type problems. Um, and you'll have plenty of time. What is 4.2? 4.2 is the mean value theorem. If you have a volume formula, you think it's going to touch the surface area, right? So That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, chopping that one down. <laughs> have a few. <laughs> but I did notice that it works on cones and stuff. Cylinders and things like that. I wonder what dang cube done screwed me up. That's darn it. All right. Remember that cover four point two? I guess I'll do that Friday. I'll review so you guys go through the review sheet. So I guess maybe Friday. Yeah, I won't review all of Friday. I'll probably cover it Friday. Yeah, like next class meeting. Thank you. Like a little over half the seven, and then ask her up in class.